I bet you're wondering why I have a Triceratops here. Well, it is a dinosaur museum. Okay, well, fair point. Not only is Triceratops a local dinosaur here in Colorado, but our little museum in conjunction with the Glen Rock Paleontological Museum in Glen Rock, Wyoming, if you've never heard of it, now you have. Mm. We've started a field program where we're digging in the famous Lance Formation. So it's Triceratops Central. And we're just getting ready to start our new season of digs this year where we're reinvestigating some old sites, prospecting for new sites. We have part of a Triceratops skeleton in the ground. Wow. We have Triceratops feeding habitat that we're investigating. It's a fantastic site. So right now I am hyper-focused on Triceratops. So in the field program in Wyoming, mm -hmm. Participants will be able to uh, potentially find quite a few Triceratops bones because you do find Triceratops bones quite frequently. We do. As it turns out, Triceratops is the most common large dinosaur that we're going to find mm. in our field program. Both the evidence of feeding in the form of shed teeth, but physical chunks of bone. Now you said this is the biggest large dinosaur you find. What's the biggest, what's the, are the, the most common large dinosaur you find? What's the most common small dinosaur? Well, the most common small dinosaurs, um, it varies from dig site to dig site because okay. these dig sites represent different habitats. Hmm. So for small dinosaurs, you can get the distant Triceratops cousin, Leptoceratops, which we hmm. find an abundance of shed teeth of, um, lots of small carnivorous dinosaurs, small enigmatic dinosaurs like Ricardo Estesia, uh, which you've never heard of before, so you've only found teeth, it's a dental taxon. Huh. Um, we find um, the occasional raptor tooth, both large and small, representing different species of raptors. Hmm. But really the most sh common shed teeth that we find are from a trio of crocodilians oh. that were abundant at the end of the Cretaceous. The most common fossil that we find though, the turtles. If you like turtles, you wanna find a dozen species of different Cretaceous turtles, this is Turtle Central. That's really cool, actually. And buried the lead there, because if you really like turtles, we're going to find turtles. Well, but that's impressive in itself. Twelve kinds of turtles. At least, yeah. I mean, how much specialization of turtle lifestyle can there be, right? I mean, that's like, an excellent like, question, because we find fragmentary shells that really good complete specimens are elusive. Huh. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that may, maybe I'm ignorant. I don't know if that many environments today that have that many kinds of turtles. No, this is a, this is turtle central. Uh, that's Western North America at the end of the Cretaceous. I mean, that's pretty turtles. curious. It is. Are they like like our painted turtles or fox turtles or what are they like? They're more like pond turtles. We do have uh, trinickets, so you have the sub-shell turtles and you do have part shell turtles. Some are more tortoise-like land-loving than, than the aquatic forms, more like a pond turtle. <laughs> so they're just, there's turtles everywhere. So like sliders, when you say pond turtles, mm -hmm. or are you yeah, thinking like snapping turtles? Flat turtles, nothing quite like a snapping turtle. Huh. Yeah. Heck, that's... Except for Triceratops' face. Right. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that itself is interesting. I think Compelling. so. I mean, you're, what you're looking at then is an entire prehistoric environment. You're really getting pieces. That's exactly what we're trying to do. So we're trying to reconstruct what the world of Triceratops was like. Right. What its habitat was like, what the community of organisms around Triceratops was how they interacted with one another, really kind of what were the, what was the life like for a tracer? Sure. What were its loves? What about these other animals? Uh, how, how, how well can we understand them with, with such little evidence that we're getting in some cases, like those mm -hmm. dental taxa, right, right. Uh, taxa like uh, Ricardo Estenia. Now, you mentioned the daily life of Triceratops. What is the daily life like for someone on a dig like this? After they're woken up by your trumpets and you make the five-star breakfast for them, well, I, you, you get awoken by me loudly screaming at you okay. because I get really excited first thing in the morning when I find something. So mm. once you're jarred awake by my exuberance, or your blood no, curdling scream. Yeah, no, I really everybody stays in the hotel. That's cool. Um, okay. But once you get out to the field site, um, depending upon the uh, level of experience our diggers have, if you've never been in a dig before, we walk you through basic field procedures. How to identify rock from bone. Mm. Um, Context, what that means, what does in situ versus ex situ mean, uh, what are some basic geological concepts, like Stino's principles, who is Nicholas Stino, why is he important, what is superposition? These are the basic questions that really mm. pertain to just basic field paleontology that we answer for you first, okay. um, and then we, we ease you into the field 
uh, with some sites that we've pre-selected that we know that we're going to find fossils. So we can teach you basic co collecting technique, just how to work a brush, things of that nature. Sure. And then the complexity get, grows from there with each individual dig, more prospecting, more challenging digs, mm -hmm. more challenging areas. And how long does each uh, program last? It depends. We have two-day programs just for weekend. We have some three-day digs and a couple of five-day digs. Well, technically one okay. five-day dig this year. And it's throughout the summer, so there's several the different... Summer. Yeah, the schedule's on the museum's website. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much You're for welcome. your time. We're going to now you. take a look at the lab. Yeah, because I think one of the fun things to do that we like to do in the field program is when we're collecting at one of our microvertebrate sites, we find lots and lots of little fossils uh, but we don't always know exactly what everything is in the field. Mm. Um, we try to preserve them, um, get them back to the lab, and then we can look at them under the microscope and try to figure out what these tiny bits mean. All right. And that's what we're going to go do right now. Let's take a look. All right, what have we got? That's a good question. Okay, so I have a section here um, on this table, which you can't see, of little tiny film canisters. And for you millennials that don't know what this is, we used to take photographs, not with our smartphones, but with actual cameras that have film in them, and they came in these canisters. You know all this, I'm being condescending. So we have thousands of these film canisters in Wyoming, uh, because it's Wyoming, and we fill them full of toilet paper and fossils. And I have a bunch of them here on this table, so we can pull them out and see what we found. I haven't even sorted these yet from last summer's digs. Oh, I hear din dinosaurs or kids screaming. Dinosaur it's a Natural History Museum, it's just how we roll. So I'm going to unwrap some of these and figure out what we've, we found. If you look up here at this monitor, um, you might be able to see some fuzzy images. It might contain a Sasquatch video or some fossils that we found. But this is something like the real process that goes on after oh, yeah. these Oh yeah, probably digs. explain that. Yeah. So really when we do collect, we do collect like this, trying to collect all the things that we're finding on the surface, uh, mapping the things that we're finding that are in place. And then because our time in the field is so limited, uh, we'll collect as quickly as we can responsibly and then bring the material back to the museum so that we can then look at them under the microscope and try to identify everything so that when it's put into collections, you know where you find, say, Triceratops teeth or anything. Hmm. Okay, so just unwrapped our first little dude here and let's take a look at it. Oh, wow. All right, what do you think this is, sir? I'll give you, I'll give you two guesses. All right, can you... I think it's a little bit of tooth. Looks toothy to me, something about it looks toothy. Toothiness. Mm -hmm. I think Stephen Colbert coined that, that phrase. Isn't so, that a Shakespearean term for beautiful? Doesn't he have like toothsome women? I don't know. I, don't I know. think of dinosaurs for living, dude. I don't know anything about Shakespeare. All right. The little Billy Shakespeare? Oh, Billy. Billy Shakespeare? He's a country music artist, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that actually be a great stage name. That would be. Do you know how to play a guitar? Wild Bill Shakespeare. Wild Bill Shakespeare. There you go. Copyrighted. The Bard of Just the High Plains. I'm gonna do it. Do it. All right. What, what, are, we, what are we talking about? Uh, this. What are we oh, about? okay. So this is cool. So this is a tooth belonging to a big horned dinosaur, Triceratops, probably, okay. maybe Taurosaurus. This is the part of the tooth that faces outside of the body. We'll put it under the microscope here. Oh, you can see that. Whoa. Nice. There you go. Now, and if I rotate it like this, check that out. See that? Uh -huh. That's the occlusal plane. So that's the chewing surface. So if you want to put your finger on the part of the tooth that was grinding Triceratops' dinner, there you go, do it. It's pretty smooth. That's very smooth, right? So this tooth lacks the bifurcated roots. So the root comes down actually and two little prongs in Triceratops teeth. That's gone mm -hmm. in this specimen. Um, at this amount of wear, and the lack of root tells me that this is a shed tooth. And thanks to the notes that we took when we collected this, we can place this tooth exactly into the habitat in which this Triceratops tooth was, was at least buried. It was buried in part of a river, so it might have been transported a, a little bit, but pretty good idea of where it's from. Now, I'm an unscientific boob, but when I looked at that, I thought it looked like a tooth. What is it that I'm seeing that makes me say, oh, that looks like a tooth? Okay. Right, something else. So this is in, in, in Hattonian terms, James Hutton, founder of, of one idea in geology um, called uniformitarianism, which we use a variation of that when we're thinking about these fossils, something called actualism. The present is the key to the past, right? So if we understand 
modern things, we can understand the ancient ones, right? right? Whether that's how a river works or how a body works. Sure. So here's the present is the key to the past. Oh, In this vial, I want you to hold that for me. What are those? Oh, it's your baby teeth. <laughs> those are my baby teeth. I shared that with you earlier. So you ruined the reveal for everybody. I carry my baby teeth around with me in a glass vial. Don't look at me like that. So these teeth are wonderful because they're from me, but also because the basic tissues that make up my teeth are the same basic tissues that make up a triceratops teeth, right? So on the outer edge, you have a dense crystalline structure called enamel. Below it, uh, a softer tissue called dentin. Hmm. And when we look at this triceratops tooth, you can see the enamel here on the outside and then a separation plane and the dentin below. Same tissues. Okay. So even though I don't consciously know that, I'm seeing something that, that looks like a tooth to me. Yeah. Now, quick question. That triceratops tooth, your baby teeth, mm -hmm. which one would sell for more on eBay? Yeah, let's run this experiment. Let's do it. Let's Bidding just, war starts now. Let's just sell everything that falls off your body. Mm. Okay. <laughs> There's going to be a market for that. <laughs> I don't want to meet the people who want to buy it, though. I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> so any hoozle. So what do you think this is? This is something I just pulled out a little bit ago. What is this? It also looks like a tooth to me. Also. Okay, but how so, do you know? Paleopestimology. How do you how do you know that that's a tooth? What tells well, you that the, that's a tooth? The conical shape of it looks maybe like a, I'm gonna say a crocodilian tooth. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. So th this is a Cretaceous crocodilian. This is another shed tooth. Look. You see the little wear patch at the tip of the tooth. You can see that the base of the tooth is gone. There's no root mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of a resorption pit. So a little convex structure within the crown of the tooth there. It's a small crocodile probably. So this little guy, so the head's, head's maybe a foot long. Okay. Um, this is the blunt tooth croc from one of our field sites. Now this is going to be interesting. So what do you think this little fossil is? And I'll put it under the scope here in a moment so you might be able to see it. I don't know. Again, it looks toothy to me. Maybe a, a lizard? Okay, it looks toothy to you, but it's not a lizard. So we do have enamel on one side of this little object that's shaped like a diamond. A little bit of a neck here. So that shiny part is enamel. Okay. And the part that's here is dentin. A little less reflective. Put it under the scope here so folks can kind of see it. Oh, oh, oh. It's almost in focus. There it is. That, my friend, is a fish scale, but not just any oh, fish scale. Right. This belongs to Lepiosis, the garfish. Hasn't changed much in 70 million years. You see teeth from a tissue standpoint, and fish scales are the same tissues, just organized a little bit differently. And huh. this shows us that big picture, the teeth are derived from structures that were scales of fish, linking all vertebrate life together. Well, what can you tell us about uh, Triceratops and its environment up there? Okay, so Triceratops, first thing you need to know about Triceratops is that it's dead, mm. as you can tell here. So it's, it's a very uh, pacific animal in this condition. When it was alive, I'm not so sure it would have been quite this peaceful. Looking at the jaws of this dinosaur, this big snapping turtle-like beak. In life, that would have been covered with the same material that your fingernails are made out of. That's keratin. And a self-sharpening sheath over those beak bones would have made the beak of a triceratops like a giant snapping turtle. Sharp, pretty deadly to a, the shin of a T-Rex. Um, the teeth, which are behind the beak, there's no teeth in the beak of triceratops. Most of these teeth had fallen out after this triceratops had died, but when they're in perfect pristine condition, you see them together in two rows, these rows of teeth that only have the hard enamel on one side. So as they grind together, they wear in such a way that makes triceratops teeth into giant scissors. They are shearing through vegetation like like hedge clippers. So between the snapping turtle beak and the hedge clipper jaws, these chompers are more deadly than a T-Rex. 
Do we have uh, any fossils that show Triceratops damage to, say, a, a Tyrannosaurus bone, something like that? Not yet, but honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if at some point we would find such a fossil. Um, when it comes to tri Triceratops, we tend to focus on these wonderful great big horns, but before I get to the horns, I do want to point out the region in which you would find the nostrils. Now, there's a bit of speculation as to where the nostrils would have gone, a lot of speculative paleobiology. Some workers want the nostrils all the way out to the front, but the actual aperture where the nostril would be does float around in modern vertebrates. And because Triceratops is so distantly related from everything we have alive and around us today, we can't say for certain where the nostril would have been. But one thing we can see is this giant empty area dedicated to air, mm -hmm. to nothing. So when the animal's blowing air through its nostril, this area could vibrate. Some mm -hmm. workers have placed in large inflatable bulbs that could have protruded out from the muzzle in these dinosaurs, maybe. Mm -hmm. but one thing's for sure, this is an echo chamber. This animal could have made noise with its nose. So if you can sing with your nose, then you can be like a triceratops. Oh, so probably a bellowing kind of sound. Very deep, maybe capable of making something like infrasound. Something like elephants do to communicate over great distances. Huh. Now the eye is interesting because when you see a lot of Triceratops toys, you can look down the muzzle of a Triceratops toys and see an eyeball staring right at you. You see that in the Jurassic Park models, for example, the mm -hmm. movies. This is a good example of why you don't trust Spielberg to teach you science, because there's a bone right in front of the eye prefrontal. Mm -hmm. And this protects the eye from getting gouged out by these horns during intraspecific combat. These animals are using their horns to beat each other up, just like the horns of, say, a bighorn sheep today. Sure. And they're butting heads, not necessarily locking horns, but if you're an elk, like you would be here in Colorado, or a deer, locking antlers uh, to compete for mates and territory. These are Triceratops goggles, if you will. The horns above, you have to remember that these are just the cores of the horns themselves. Mm. So in life, they would have been covered again with keratin, the stuff that your nails and hair made out of. And there's evidence here on the surface of the horns, blood vessels, um, vascularization. This is the plumbing to feed the corium that then nourishes the actual horn growing off, maybe doubling the ultimate size of these horns. Wow. So this is just the that core, would be a, not but, actual size. But that would make the head of this thing I mean, the size of a whale head. I mean, that's that's enormous. This is a big head, and what's yeah. wonderful about Triceratops, all right, my hat down here, is that it's perfectly balanced in the back of the head. Hmm. Perfectly balanced right here at this joint. This is the occipital condyle. This is the joint that connects the head to the more or less fused neck of a Triceratops. If undistorted, uncrushed by being buried in the ground, you could put a pole right here and the triceratops skull should be balanced. I'll be. So this thick bony frill, this is the brain case, which I have as detachable in this cast skull. Um, this heavy bony frill is counterbalanced by the long muzzle of the dinosaur on the neck because triceratops can't move its neck. The uh, first portion of its neck is so well fused together, there's no motion there. And even the base of its neck, there's very restricted motion. So if Triceratops wants to move its head around, it does so at that ball and socket joint. Now the simple condyle that you and I have in our heads is paired, it's bifurcated like an amphibian, mm. um, which is part of the rationale that links personal injury and divorce attorneys to salamanders and frogs. <laughs> um, because we have paired a simple condyles, dinosaurs, have a singular condyle. T-Rex, it's more shaped like a legume, whereas Triceratops, perfect ball and socket. So <laughs> imagine this giant ball and socket, wobbly-headed dinosaur moving its head in any direction at the twitch of its neck muscles. Um, it's, and especially when you consider it's wielding these giant horns and a sharp snapping beak, this is a formidable head. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah. Well, and then, uh... So the head is well protected. Yes. The rest of the body, is there some armor of any kind? Like, are there skin impressions maybe with scutes like you see in some nodosaurs, that, that yeah. kind of thing? You know, nodosaurs are interesting because they have 
bony plates embedded within the skin. They don't connect into the muscle, but they're within thick hide. Mm -hmm. They're no different than the armor that we see in modern day crocodiles and alligators. And sure. then you have an osteoderm, a piece of bone that's covered with nail and connected by Sharpie's fibers onto the, onto the hide. Uh, with Triceratops, we do have skin impressions in this region and patches of the rest of the body. These are large scales, hexagonal scales. Um, some scales seem to lead into what looks to be a nipple-like structure, maybe supporting a quill, but no <laughs> actual evidence of a quill as of yet, uh, but no armor per se in the skin. Um, but the skin does look like it's pretty well thick, maybe keratinized scutes, pretty thick indeed. Um, neat thing about Triceratops though, is that if it wanted to move the armored section of its body to face a potential foe, it was not an issue for Triceratops to turn. When we look at its shoulder girdle and its forelimbs, they're incredibly well muscled. Hmm. And this animal can move its limbs like this, adduct and abduct its arms in such a way where it can spin around and move its okay. head towards something that scares it really fast. So is this, this isn't a clumsy creature in spite of its, its size and, and bulk? No, this is not a clumsy creature. Moving with deliberation through late Cretaceous swamps. You asked earlier what the habitat was like that mm. Triceratops was living in. That's um, a question we're trying to answer, at least with one okay. specific field area in Wyoming. And the evidence that we're getting, we're, we have within an estuary, so a network of streams that are coming together and dumping into a large lake. We have an abundance of teeth of a large ceratops, and probably triceratops, could be torosaurus, we can't distinguish the difference between those two teeth. But what we're seeing is that in this estuary, this, there's scores, hundreds of triceratops like <laughs> teeth. And these are not teeth from dead animals, they lack the root, and they're really worn down. These are teeth that were shed when these animals were feeding. See. So what we're beginning to reconstruct and gain insight to is the feeding habitat for Triceratops hmm. in these swampy river bottom areas. Um, adjacent to those areas and more open shallow lakes or on flats next to the lakes, we're finding hadrosaur tracks. Uh, so a big dumbbell hmm. dinosaur. So there might be a little bit of ecological segregation going on there. So that way you have these big plant eating dinosaurs that are not in direct competition for the same resources. They're not living in the exact same habitat. So that's interesting. Now, in these estuary environments, we're finding these shed ceratopsian teeth. We're also finding bits and pieces of carnivorous dinosaurs too, the animals mm. that would have fed upon dinosaurs like Triceratops. And I've given you a nice cast specimen here. Um, this is a T-Rex tooth cast. Belongs to the skull nickname stand, which is right over there at the frame. Uh, but this is a dead tooth. When I talk about a dead tooth, you have the crown here, which would, you can see poking out of the mouth, and then you have the root, the part of the tooth that you don't see. What's interesting about dinosaurs is they have a fantastic dental plan, never ending supply of teeth, so that they will lose teeth and regrow them throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. This tooth is anchored in the jaw with a periodontal ligament, and when it begins to wear out, wear to the point where it's no longer useful, the root is resorbed back into the jaws, and all that's left keeping this tooth crown in the jaw is a little weak periodontal ligament. So the next time this Rex or Triceratops bites into something hard, that tooth falls out. What's wonderful about that is that tooth will fall out around what the animal was eating. Uh, and if you keep that tooth in context of the rock you find it in, mm, that's I the see. habitat, the environment deposition, potential habitat of that feeding animal. It's really interesting. So you can begin to reconstruct this food web of these animals that we've never actually watched feed, but we have this direct evidence of their feeding behavior. A mm. dead tooth versus a shed tooth, which is just the crown. Now, I look at a skull like this, I look at a body plan like Triceratops, mm -hmm. and the animal today that comes to my mind is pig, right? Like suet. Is that kind of what I should be thinking about in terms of their habits, do you think? Don't listen. I'm going to cover Triceratops' I'm not, ears. I'm not back calling here. you a pig. <laughs> um, but Triceratops is easily offended. I, I'm um, sure. Well, I wouldn't want to actually offend it. But 
Do you think something like the omnivorous habits? Something like a, a boar? It has been speculated like that? that they they might have been omnivorous. Um, there's there's at least one paper that I'm aware of that speculates that. Um, even horses and deer will eat carrion or try to absorb um, oh, sure. um, bones in some way, chewing on them, eating nestling birds. Um, red deer do that in Scotland. Or they accidentally um, eat some amount of meat or bugs or whatever. Like Yeah, yeah I mean, a bit of extra protein or calcium to help build the skeleton. I mean, that's right. certainly possible. Hmm. Yeah. Although, digging up skeletons, um, from what I've known, this might just be a sampling error, or I've the era of data simply not being recorded. Sure. I don't know of a situation in which shed triceratops teeth have been found around the skeleton. For example, the no, skeleton not... that, yeah, that I'm digging up in Wyoming right now with our paleontic crew, uh, we have we do have shed teeth from a small tyrannosaur around that skeleton, suggesting that that skeleton of the triceratops, meaning torosaurus, was fed upon by a small tyrannosaur. Is that the nanotyrannus? They are nanotyrannus great teeth, yeah. yeah. Definitely now, which look nothing like the Rex teeth, right, at all. That's a subject for another video. Yeah, I have brought out here from collections just some fragments. Um, here we have a nice hunk of frill from a triceratops. You can see how thick it is. All these wonderful deep grooves that would support blood vessels that nourish the skin growing atop here. It's a little bit hard to see, but this little bone, this is an epi. Um, Epi, which one is it? That's a parietal, that's a squamosal. Um, call them epiocipitals. This little guy here is a little armored, jagged fragment that grows within the hide and infuses to the skull <laughs> later in life. And here's actually a nice, a better example where you have a younger specimen, so the contact isn't quite as obliterated, but a nice little hornlet growing oh, onto the edge of the frill. Check that out. Huh. Yeah, so it's actually, you can see a, a suture line almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They grow up in the hide and infuse the skull as the animals mature. You see how thick and dense that bone is? Yeah, absolutely. So there's really only a trio of bones here. You know, the big parietal bone here, and then the squamosal here, and then on the other side. You see the sutures here of this young triceratops skull. I see. On this side and the other side. Oh, so this is a young one. That we're looking at right yeah. now. See. Small young triceratops. So on an older triceratops, it would be smooth. <laughs> well, actually, the other thing that, that gets funny is the younger skulls tend to be smoother, and as the animals grow, this sort of rugose, rough, bumpy texture uh -huh. that you see on the skull begins to take over the entire head, obliterating <laughs> most of the sutures, especially those here in the muscle. It makes them really hard to see. Interesting. They develop this kind of unified rugose texture as they get bigger and bigger. But that must make the skull, even of a living animal, just hard as rock. Yeah, they get big and dense and heavy. Impressive. Yeah. Visit beautiful Morrison, Colorado and the Morrison Natural History Museum. Say hello to Mossberger if you want to. And for now, from beautiful Colorado, let us wish you all the best. Are we on now? Yeah. I also have to watch what I say now. Yeah. Yeah, careful about those slanderous remarks. You know, um, just just so you know, viewers at home, I'm not normally this awkward. <laughs> if you actually talk to me as if you were a human being, and I was a human being, I mean, I wouldn't even say things like that if I, I wasn't being filmed right now. So right. all of my, my general general charisma and suavitude are gone. So visit because the... it's hard for me to compete with Dr. Crawford here. Uh huh. Yeah. So. So visit the museum if you want to meet the real Mossbrecher and not this boob. In front yeah, of your own home. I'll be hiding in my office, but if you knock politely, and I'll know if it's polite, I might talk to you. It'll yeah. be fun. Give it a try. Or not. It's cool, too. Conveniently located within a decent drive of Denver. Like a half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you drive like me, 10 minutes. Yeah, well, if you drive like me, it's about two. Oh, it's always competition with you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right. I can get to Wyoming in an hour from here. I can too if I'm at the border. The worst dig. Is that recording?